Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, another episode for Thinkers Dialogue. We have a very special guest today with us, uh, and he is Christian Kettles. Uh, in fact, uh, Christian is uh, part of the Harvard Business School faculty. In fact, uh, he's been the chief economist for uh, BCG, uh, has done some extensive work in the area of competitiveness and economic development. So in fact, uh, he's been part of the core team uh, with Michael Porter. In fact, Mike Porter and Christian Kettles have done some amazing level of work together over a, over a period of time. Uh, in fact, uh, if you really uh, ask me, then if there is, uh, if you rank, or if you really look at the top three people in the uh, area of competitiveness, uh, then it has to be Michael Porter, Christian Kettles, and Christian Kettles. So that, that's uh, how I actually look at it. Uh, done some amazing work. In fact, I've known Christian for, I think, about uh, 15 years now. Uh, and uh, we have been part of the MOC network, uh, which uh, wherein uh, uh, Christian was instrumental in really setting it up in many, many ways. And he has been one of the big guiding forces for the Microeconomics and Competitiveness Network. Uh, he's been uh, the president of the Competitiveness Institute of PCI, which is a network of competitiveness practitioners. Uh, more than that, uh, I think I can hazard to say that, that Christian has been a great friend over a period of time, uh, who has been a great guiding uh, Light as well uh, in terms of like my work uh, that I've done, especially on competitiveness in India, uh, something related to clusters, shared value over a period of time. I think Christian was instrumental in many, many ways uh, to really get me into all this work. Uh, in fact, uh, I do not know if Christian would ever even remember because he's been so kind over the years that uh, he was the person who got me into speaking at World Economic Forum a few times. Uh, so uh, I don't even think he remembers that. But then uh, Christian, uh, it's just been an honor to know you and have you as a great friend. Uh, and thanks a lot for uh, joining us uh, today. Well, thank you so much, Amit. Uh, the, the honor is all mine. Uh, you were way too kind in your introduction. Um, you know, I'm uh, honored by uh, also our friendship. And actually, there are many things that I've been able to learn from you, you know, uh, not the least, I think. Uh, getting more insights into what's going on in India, which I think is one of the most dynamic and interesting places in the world that uh, we all need to think about uh, uh, in the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you, you've also, of course, been a role model in kind of in, in your entrepreneurship and, and how you've been able to kind of communicate and use economic ideas uh, to really have an impact. Uh, I think that's a uh, a passion we both share. Uh, we're interested in academic research and analysis and understanding complex issues, but ultimately I think we're motivated by um, helping people to make different choices, hopefully better choices, whether that's in policy making or whether that's in corporate functions uh, and leading companies. Thank you, Christian. Thanks a lot, Christian, for the kind words, but we'll just quickly dive into the you know, conversation and really understand. You know, like, Christian, the last one year has just been absolutely crazy. Uh, it's just been uh, shattering in many, many ways for many businesses, for many countries. And it has really uh, what I call redefined the way, uh, the way the world functions. And if I really ask you, like, how do you think this whole change has had an impact on the views of growth that you might have actually have, or the world would actually look at the idea of growth per se? as we uh, look at in the times of the pandemic. Yeah, I think obviously, you know, we're, we're still right in the middle of this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm based in Europe. I live in Europe. Uh, Europe, unfortunately, has, has become uh, the, the, the global kind of hotspot of, uh, of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think we're also, at least so far, the part of the, glo of the world economy that's probably struggling the most uh, and kind of dealing with these outcomes. Um, we had our fair share of crisis before, but I think this is still a new experience for many advanced economies and societies uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, it uh, challenges us to think newly about the role of the government, uh, about our priorities, uh, you know, what's really important for society, what's really important for us individually uh, overall, how do we want to organize ourselves. Um, but I think exactly as you say, I think it also challenges us um, to think newly about uh, the purpose of growth, uh, how we can achieve it, uh, the notion of, of competitiveness. And I think we're still far away from, an, uh, from being able to give definite, definite answers. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I have some, some observations that we can talk about, but actually one of my biggest frustrations is that although we talk a lot about 
building back better. And, you know, now we're going to use this crisis as a big kind of moment of change and as a transition towards a better future. Um, most of the things that you hear is actually people just saying what they said before, only louder uh, and, you know, with more conviction. And now is really the time to do the right type of things. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not uh, faulty of the same thing. You know, I think maybe that's our natural tendency fall back to kind of our, let's say, ideological positions in a time of uncertainty. But I think if we truly want to learn something, we have to step back and, and really think through uh, which of our prior positions continue to be correct and you know, useful and which we might have to change because the world around us uh, has changed so, so tremendously. Christian, you make a very important point and that is, how do we really look at what are the prior positions that were correct for us or how we have actually gone back to the set of beliefs that we were actually holding or set of ideas that we were holding? I'm sure you have gone through this yourself. Uh, what do you think was one of the prior positions that you have actually adhered to or something that you've actually wanted to relook and rethought and looked at different ideas? Yeah, you know, I, I would uh, point on two things where I really think we need to think uh, in a different way than we've usually done in our in our analysis of competitiveness, kind of the underlying drivers of productivity and innovation and often, you know, long term prosperity trends. So I think one thing that we have done in the past and uh, is really to look at the inside, you know, we try to understand the location, the country, a region, a city, we try to understand its clusters, its sectors in which it operates, uh, the business environment and so on. Um, and then, you know, develop thoughts on how we can improve that. But it was often a, um, an, an inward looking diagnostics. And in some ways, it was a reaction towards, uh, I think, other approaches that have talked about growth strategies for locations that have kind of been um, location neutral and said, you know, you don't actually need to understand the minutia of this country or region, uh, you know, because there are some fundamental truth about what drives growth. And it's basically, it's just applying these kind of general uh, uh, lessons to that location. So, so I think we, we, we always were different in the sense that we saw, you know, we don't have one answer for every place. We have a framework, but that has to apply to this place. Now, now what's new? Um, obviously, I think the crisis has had an impact on these fundamentals within our locations, you know, whether it's a city or region uh, or, or a country. And those changes are actually not so different from what we've seen uh, in the past in terms of crisis. You know, I mean, companies have looked at their R&D expenditures, countries kind of have, have focused resources on other things in you know, health policy and so on that were uh, urgent priorities to address. But I think the real change is that the world around us is changing. You know, we see the, the, the core of global economic activity is moving to Asia. That was uh, a trend that was also the case before, um, but, you know, it has been accelerated, um, you know, through, through the, the different responses that we've seen in Asia to the pandemic, uh, you know, maybe the slower responses or the higher impact that we've seen uh, in Europe. Digitalization, you know, again, another trend that, that had been before, uh, but has been massively um, accelerated through the crisis. So we have to think through what that means. Uh, there might be other things, you know, the macroeconomic policy environment that we are facing, uh, the shape of the geopolitical system, including uh, the trade system and so on might, have, might be changing and so on and so on and so on. What that means is that while locations haven't really changed, you know, in terms of their assets and capabilities, the value of these assets and capabilities has changed quite a bit. And, you know, to give, give you one concrete example, you know, I'm, I, I live in Sweden, but I'm, uh, I, I grew up in Germany. Um, if you think about the German car industry, you know, which is enormously powerful wealth generation machine, but it is now affected by uh, a d very different geopolitical uh, uh, environment. And obviously uh, the, the transition in terms of uh, carbon intensity and, you know, what we, how, how we uh, uh, operate uh, uh, cars and so on. So there is a total redefinition of the values that this sector has. Uh, and it's not only positive or only negative, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 
quite optimistic that the sector will be able to kind of re reinvent itself. But it basically means that while what we see there hasn't changed, the value of their assets and capabilities in the global environment has changed quite a lot. And I think that this is something that we really have to work into in our competitiveness um, analysis in a much more systematic way uh, than we've done it before. And, you know, I mean, maybe we need uh, something around the diamond, you know, that, that, that uh, kind of re re reinvents or, or re-recognizes the environment around, um, around the diamond in this, in this, in this new world. That's that's one you know one point. The other one is is uh, maybe even harder to 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 kind of describe in a, in a, in a very clear way. But uh, the the whole notion of competitiveness is driven by a strong focus on productivity, and basically because you know there's a lot of evidence, a lot of research that shows that productivity differences ultimately are the critical driver in terms of kind of in a mathematical sense explaining why some locations are so much more prosperous than others. But it has also kind of led to a maybe a bit narrow focus on kind of GDP measures, uh, on average prosperity as, uh, as the type of, of kind of yardstick of whether the competitiveness that you've created in your economy ultimately generates wealth for your pop uh, population. Now we've always known that, uh, and also said hopefully uh, in in our presentations and work that um, that there's no reason to think about it in this narrow way. You know, we 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 have to think about inclusive growth. Uh, we have to think about you know how is a, a normal person in society doing? What are the opportunities, the economic opportunities, uh, and conditions that they're facing? We have to think about the non-GDP parts. Of prosperity, you know, whether it's uh, uh, um, climate change, whether it's health, whether it's inclusion, whether it's personal rights, safety, and so on. So there is a much broader sense of these uh, of these goals. I do think that this crisis um, has kind of refocused people's minds on what is really important in terms of our quality of life and you know what type of life we aspire to. And so I think if we want to be relevant as people that do competitiveness analysis, we need to be much more thoughtful in how we build this in. It's not just done with you know, a few slides at the beginning that say, yeah, we also need to measure environmental footprint and you know, whether uh, you know, inequality and these type of things. I think we need to think more through the entire logical chain of our analysis from competitiveness fundamentals to the type of sectors that we see, the type of activities, the type of economic activities to final prosperity and how these kind of broader measures of productivity, but kind of thought in a, in a, in a wider way are integrated. And uh, I think that's a journey that's only beginning. I don't think we're, we're quite there yet, but of course, you know, you, you've worked on social progress uh, indicators for, for India. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work in this field, but I think you know, we now need to kind of integrate that more to make sure we're not creating new silos um, besides the kind of more traditional uh, economic analysis. So Christian, you know, like you, you're making a very important point here. And what, what I see, and this is again, like something that we have had a chat about, and that is about bringing social objectives and economic objectives together. And this is where, and doing much more in a much more powerful way, not really looking at it as silos, but how do we break that barrier? Because until now, if you really look at it, what has really happened is that people have just said, oh, there is this GDP growth and there is this part of the climate change story and whatever. How do we really intertwine these two ideas? Because that is what you're alluding to. And that becomes very important for us to really focus on as we move forward. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have a very coherent answer to this absolutely central question yet. But I see it popping up in, in a lot of different um, places. You know, obviously I talked about the, the, let's say the outcome measurement, you know, what's at the end? You know, it's not just GDP per capita for the average individual in our society. You know, we need a broader range of understanding what's going on. Um, we need to think about innovation in different ways. You know, we, we, we have thought about innovation as sort of the Silicon Valley model of, you know, we create the next Facebook or Google or whatever. Uh, we, we know that that uh, is a model that makes uh, a few people very rich, but but doesn't really spread 
um, prosperity more widely in society. So if we want to create an environment in which innovation uh, kind of can emerge and, 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 and really be a driving force, how we make sure that that also is uh, a type of a society that's more broadly innovative. Um, you know, yes, there is a lot of interesting stuff on social innovation and so on, but it hasn't come really together yet. I think it's still very different kind of uh, camps that, that look at these type of issues. There is some, some emerging interesting work that I, I, I think uh, looks much more at, uh, at imbalances that occur in, in kind of very successful innovative economies. You know, let's think Israel, for example, you know, super successful in terms of bringing companies to NASDAQ and so on, but uh, quite a lot of challenges in society, you know, you know, spreading out this, um, this value is difficult. And I think that's one, one of the things to look at. The same is true for more traditional economic development and productivity views. You know, I think uh, um, there's a lot of work on understanding the, the differences in potential and, you know, wealth creation opportunities in different sectors. You know, the whole literature on structural transformation is about that, you know, moving out of agriculture into higher value added industry and so on. Um, but I think we re to, need to recognize that, that uh, there are also differences in how possible it is to create inclusive growth. You know, things like food production, for example, uh, things like retail, uh, you know, these are sectors that are not at the top of the productivity distribution but they are important entry points for people to kind of come into more organized modern parts of the economy. And if, you, if we raise productivity there by five, 10%, we affect many more people's lives than if we make our biotech sector, which is, you know, as we know now, also very important, but if we make that uh, uh, so much more important. So, so I think we have to bring this perspective in in many different aspects uh, as we're shaping our strategies to upgrade competitiveness and locations. So Christian, you know, like what I hear you say is something very important and that is you, you're talking about views of growth from a microeconomic point of view. And that is where you're bringing the whole aspect of innovation into the picture. Uh, and then how do we really take a step wherein wealth creation that does happen, which is more equitable, which is more distribution, uh, more distributed. Uh, and because what we are really seeing in the world is this whole huge uh, set of growth of enterprises which are controlling wealth, controlling information, but that has an impact on competitiveness per se, or what you would call as microeconomic competitiveness. So how do we really set that track? Because, because the, what you're really saying is at the heart of the problem itself, because if they are going to be talking about huge wealth at one end, you're talking about disparity at the other end. That is actually going to create challenges as we really move into the future. Yeah, yeah. You know, as, as, as a German, I'm, I'm quite shaped by, by this intellectual tradition of what's, what's called the social market economy. Uh, and people sometimes talk about this as, you know, a uh, uh, market economy that's, that's kind of not allowed to run at, at full speed, you know, that's, that's kind of tamed. Um, I think actually the idea is a different one. I think it's an idea that is very market oriented in the sense that it strongly believes that the market mechanism is enormously powerful in creating prosperity, also shared prosperity and innovation and kind of fair distribution um, uh, of outcomes. However, and this is where the social comes in, it recognizes that you need to create this context for effective rival rivalry functioning markets and competition. If you have a market that sounds open, you know, there's private enterprise and there's no intervention by governance, government and so on, but there's one company that really totally com um, dominates this market, you know, we know that this is not leading to efficient outcomes. Uh, this is not the best way to, to, to organize this. So I think we need to create a structure that thinks much more about how can we make more people competitive, more firms competitive and create structures that then create not only you know, high aggregate, but also widely shared uh, prosperity. So it's a very different idea from, from distribution, you know, that says, oh, you know, everybody gets his or her universal personal in you know, uh, income, um, you know, because we tax the Googles and Facebooks of this world and then we redistribute. We, we try to think about you know, how can we make sure that these individuals actually can be value creators and be competitive and productive. 
Now, that being said, you know, I, I, I do think uh, we are facing very difficult questions in how we make sure that we retain or when needed create effective markets and rivalry uh, under the technological realities of platforms and so on. You know? So uh, I don't think competitiveness has, has any, any uniquely different or better insight in how to make that happen. Um, this is clearly an important topic, but, but I do think you know, this is where it brings more our view on productivity together with a sense on how does that translate into shared prosperity. So that's an interesting point. And just going back to one of the previous things that you'd actually said on importance of locations and regions. But because what you said is, what I hear you say is that it is now fundamentally more important to understand that how do we look at countries from their, from their regions or how do we understand its regions better, really understand competitiveness. Did I get you right in when you were saying that? Yeah, I think this is one of the 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 key issues that we are we are we are facing, uh, uh, you know, apart from some of the other issues that we already discussed, but you know, I mean, we we have seen an economy that's not only kind of in the at the interpersonal level sh struggling with with shared prosperity and inequality, but also at the uh, geographic level, at the locational level, um, you know, especially in the in, in countries like the U.S. and the U.K., but also to some degree in India. Uh, we've seen divergence. You know, we have enormous economic uh, hotspots. You know, where a lot of things happen and people make fortunes, and that's great. And new ideas and companies are getting born. Uh, but we also have large shares of of countries where there seems to be no hope, no pro no prospect, no way forward. Um, very much in contrast to you know our you know, old liberal models of economies where there will be catch up and you know capital flowing to these lower wage regions. Um, and that has a lot to do with, uh, uh, you know, with, with the notion of skills and technologies. Um, uh, you know, the, the best skilled people are most productive if they are together with other best skilled people. And that creates places like Silicon Valley and so on. Um, but I think we see examples, maybe more in, in Europe, um, that policy makes a difference. Um, and, you know, you create, can create an environment where there are different locations that are good at different things. Uh, and so not all skilled, super, power, uh, you know, super productive people are in one place, but there are many places. And, and then that creates value that's also shared by others, you know, that provide services that work in these operations and so on. But this is one of the, the, the high priority issues for us to tackle. You know, I mean, regional policy was always a little bit of a, of, of a niche Theme, you know, who cares because, you know, regions don't have that much money and the really important political choices are made in the capitals and so on. Um, but if you see that regional diversity, you know, uh, divergence leads to things like Brexit, or it leads to, you know, voting for populist uh, politicians, uh, it all of a sudden, sudden matters even for those that think they are isolated in their, you know, hotspots of innovation and, and, and high patenting. So it is an issue for all of us, how we can create machines that work better for everyone um, and not just only for a few. So Christian, you know, like just trying to bring a lot of thoughts that you've shared. One is of course, uh, you said that these are the regions we have to talk about personal equity. We have to really find solutions. Uh, and then of course you said like there is this whole notion wherein countries get obsessed with the idea of really creating Silicon Valleys in their regions. Uh, but then Silicon Valley is uh, an aggregation of a lot of things that uh, got uh, right together. Uh, there's a very different kind of innovation that happens there. So how do we really make policymakers? Or how do we really make people believe or understand what needs to be done? How, how do we really understand innovation in a unique way? How do we really look at policy in the right direction? Because that becomes a very important point. Yeah. No, no I, I do think, you know, this is where, where I, you know, um, Mike Porter's ideas, you know, I think who have been influential in many ways, but I think here's one of his ideas, the idea of strategy and choice and positioning becomes really important. Um, again, you know, I think we have in economics often a, a view that is either only focused on the negative, uh, you know, avoiding market failures, uh, removing bottlenecks and barriers or, or, or so on, uh, but also that there is kind of one optimum, you know, that we move towards, you know, uh, we all want to move to the most complex product space. Uh, we all want to move to the highest innovation activities and so on. 
and I think what 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 Michael Porter's work in in uh, corporate strategy really established is that there there are different ways to compete successfully, and I truly believe that this is the same for locations. We need to we can get inspired by Silicon Valley. It's in many ways a fantastic machine, you know, of, of really transforming many industries, fantastic ideas, new products and services. But you still have to choose and shape your own destiny for your location. In many ways, that's much harder than um, just trying to copy and benchmark somebody else. You know, here in Europe, we had this phenomena uh, when Nokia was still in its heydays. You know, everyone went to Olu, uh, the city in Finland, and said, you know, wow, these are the innovation leaders. You know, we, we have to do exactly like the guys in Olu. Well, but then, you know, Nokia lost its luster and, you know, Apple took over and uh, now we're not benchmarking Olu anymore. And it's not so much because they did something wrong or, you know, they do things differently now, but you have to recognize that what, are, what, what is your positioning? Um, you and I, we, we work uh, both a lot of with our colleagues in the Basque country in Spain. Um, they made, uh, you know, after Franco, when they kind of uh, reestablished their notion as, as a region and what they wanted to do, um, they saw around them all the talk about services and manufacturing and industry is the past and you get out of this and you know, non-tangible assets and so on. But they decided that our past and our capabilities are in industrial activities and manufacturing. And so they focused on that. And they've been very successful with this. Now, whether that's the right answer for the future, who knows? But they have made their choice and they've aligned a lot of their activities around being as good as they could be in that market that they decided for themselves. Um, I, you know, I, I think that is, is, is really something that we need to focus much more on. The problem is that in economics and in you know, economic policy advice, this notion of strategy is uh, th there, there are very few experts, you know, a lot of people like to use the term, but in fact, there are very few people that are able to play in that space. Um, and so what we get is a lot of functional specialists that say, no, you know, I'm a specialist on, let's say, special economic zones. And so everybody should do a special economic zone. Um, uh, or, you know, you set up very fancy goals and say, you know, well, we want to reach this type of growth or something. But, but this integration on what's the value that we want to propose as a location, how does that trickle to, through, through to activities? I think that's really something that, in my view, is, is just not done enough. Um, and this is what we will actually need more in the future, I think. Christian, you know, like you made two very important points. Uh, one was, of course, you, you talked about countries wanting to move towards a location, wanting to look at more complex product spaces. And, and then, of course, the other thing is like, how does a location or a country or a region find its unique strengths where it should, or capabilities where it should focus on? Uh, when you talk about like, both these things or ideas seem to be divergent. Uh, because when you talk about Hosman's idea, then you're talking about moving forward to complex spaces and really creating value added there or whatever. But what we are saying is that we need to understand our existing strength and build accordingly. Uh, how do we really bring these two ideas together? Or uh, that there is some divergence of views or we, we can't really uh, get to agree on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, uh, first of all, you know, I, I am a big fan of, of the complexity work and, you know, what Hausman and his colleagues have done. I, I think uh, um, it has provided a lot of insights It provided very useful data, I think, for us to think about the role of sectoral composition of the economy. I think uh, uh, we know that richer locations are active in different industries and poorer locations. And we also know that richer locations are supporting a broader set. So, you know, a more diversified portfolio of advanced uh, activities than poorer locations. I think the, the, the question is really, you know, what does that mean for policy? You know, should we actively try to focus on the right sectors, getting into the more complex industries and see that as the way to create prosperity, sustainable prosperity? Or is the emergence and broadening of a more complex activity space in a location not actually the result of underlying changes 
in competitive capabilities and assets that you're creating. I think that is what is for, you know, leads to quite different policy choices. And obviously, you know, if you listen carefully to Hausman, for him, activities are basically the signs that you have underlying capabilities. So I think for, you know, we don't have any disagreement there. I think it's more in the translation to the policymakers that hear that, okay, you know, so automotive is great because, uh, you know, th that's on a higher complexity stage and it's connected to a lot of other sectors. So if I do that, I can diversify into a lot, a lot of other areas. So let's subsidize automotive companies or create my national automotive champion. Um, what we would argue from our competitiveness analysis is to say that that's the wrong way to look at it. You know, if you create an automotive sector, that's great but it will have to be built to have these positive imp imp implications. It will have to be built on shaping conditions in which automotive companies can be productive, innovative and competitive also in international markets. And for that, you know, it's much more about thinking the, through the competitive advantages that you wanna create in your location and then seeing the sectors as an outcome rather than the other way around. So Christian, you, you said uh, looking at international markets and this, this leads to a very important question on globalization. Uh, how, do you, how do you think, uh, or what do you think about patterns of globalization at this point in time? And then of course, how do you think globalization is changing as well, or it is getting affected because of the pandemic? There is, there is so much change uh, that has actually happened in the last 12 to 18 months, and which might actually have a very profound impact on how the world operates in the future. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. I, you know, I, I do think, you know, clearly the, the global landscape is, is, is changing. Um, I, I think it's, it's also increasingly clear that we are not seeing the destruction of globalization as we knew it. It's more a kind of a transformation of globalization uh, as we knew it. You know, I mean, I think one surprising tidbit was the, the, the fact that global trade has recovered so quickly. Uh, after the crisis, uh, you know, I mean, initially uh, when the pandemic struck last year, I think people said, you know, this is going to take many years before we go back, you know, in terms of trade as a, as a share of, glo of global GDP to those type of levels. Uh, in fact, it happened very quickly. Uh, that had to do with the specific nature of this crisis and so on. But I think it's, it, it's more a, a, a marker that we should be careful not to Kind of take too many, uh, uh, make too strong an argument about uh, things that are uh, uh, that are happening. Now, more fundamentally, you know, I think if you if you look at what is happening, um, you know, the, the 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 last phase of globalization, you know, with China joining the WTO and really global trade uh, uh, expanding so much, was driven by a combination of technological changes, you know, uh, both the ITC revolution, but also container ship and so on that really uh, made it possible to create global value chains and really leverage the advantage, the, the competitive and comparative advantages of different locations in the world uh, in global value chains. Um, so technology change played a big role, but of course also policy changes um, that, that uh, led to a reduction of tariff barriers, a general opening up, of many business environments and so on. And both of those led to the growth of globalization. Now, what's happening now? I mean, I think in, the, in terms of technology, it's still the case that um, uh, we so see only new ways in which the traditional transaction costs of global trade are being diminished. Uh, you know, if you think about the platforms like, uh, um, uh, like Amazon and others, uh, uh, you know, this makes it possible now for even small companies to access customer groups in foreign countries. You think about digitalization of goods and services, um, so kind of uh, services on demand that are online and so on. This makes it much easier to kind of provide your service without a physical presence or physical export to another market. I think that is going to actually increase the, the opportunities for global trade. Now on the political side, I, I do think it's, it's, it's as we've been discussing a lot under the Trump presidency, uh, obvious that we are in, in more difficult um, uh, waters now. Uh, I think there's uh, less, we can less rely on established global rules or the system of the WTO. We probably um, see more discretion in, in policy choices of individual countries. Uh, 
Uh, but even there, I think it's not, not so simple to say, you know, we, we just see a new era of protectionism. Um, we see a new, new era of complexity. You know, a lot of FTAs, a lot of individual free trade agreements and so on, um, but not the global solutions that we have had, had in the past. Um, final point, um, and you know, I owe that, you know, particular to my, my former colleagues at, at, at BCG, you know, before I left there, I think, you know, they, they really did a lot of research uh, as, as other, others on global consumers. And I think we increasingly see that uh, there are different trends in terms of consumer needs and behaviors and so on in different markets. You know, that is key also for companies. Um, but the result is that, you know, I think we're, we're unlikely to see a, a reduction in global linkages, but it's going to be reshaped. You know, specific things are going to be even more global than before, but other things are going to be more macro or more regional uh, than we see them. And um, final point maybe on, on that, you know, I think we, we have a lot of discussion uh, here, here in, in Europe, we call it strategic autonomy. Um, you know, other people talk about resilience and, you know, how do you make sure that you, especially in a crisis situation, not depend so much on others. Um, I think that will, will turn out to be a very short-sighted political push if we get this wrong, because of course, resilient means uh, different options, you know, and some options are abroad, some options are at home, um, but it doesn't mean that you do everything at home. Uh, and I think companies are very aware of that, you know, bringing activity back from Asia to Europe or to the US usually means higher costs. They will always look at that in the context of, okay, what's the best technology? What do I, what do consumers pay for? But, but there I don't expect kind of major shifts that happen very quickly. These uh, economic consequences are too large and quite frankly, the, the global value chains are too complex and have taken years to build up uh, too quickly kind of uh, restructure. So uh, Christian, uh, when you say like global value chains are so complex, uh, of course they are, but then there, there is, this pandemic has also shown us, and of course, something that has happened in the last uh, seven or 10 days, and that's about the Suez Canal. Uh, there is this one blockage, one ship block blocks the canal, and then 10% of the global trade just comes to a scorching halt. So how do we build resilience in the system is going to be very, very critical, because that also leads us to a very important question as to what you're saying. Uh, how do companies really focus on diversifying their uh, what called, supply base over a period of time so that they really yeah. don't get entrenched into what they are and they, they reduce their risks. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a, obviously a, that's a conversation that's happening in many boardrooms around the world. Um, uh, you know, how do we react to that? I think there's more awareness now of this uh, uh, fragility of, of, of some of these global value chains, exposure to risks. But I think one has to be very clear, um, you know, if, if you look at this from the individual company perspective and individual doesn't mean small, doesn't also mean a large company, but for them it's, uh, you know, um, what are the private costs and benefits? Um, you know, if, if, if I create as a company uh, uh, a much more resilient supply base, you know, with, with higher cost suppliers in my home country and then maybe two or three other places beyond the traditional suppliers in Asia, I have ongoing higher costs, but I might be kind of the lucky person that, that actually then is in a better spot when the crisis hits. Now, you know, that depends on your assessment of how likely it is that these crises will actually occur. It will also depend on your assessment on how are governments going to react? You know, are they quickly going to bail out my rivals and help them financially during the crisis? Um, and so I think overall, it's not so clear cut that companies kind of will take the private costs, even if we socially maybe think that, you know, this would be better for our country. So I think there are important policy choices to say, okay, you know, how can we uh, make it profitable and rational to create value chains that are in this sense, a little bit more resilient and not depend just on one location. To some degree, I think this is happening automatically. But again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not seeing that there's going to a massive short-term shift if this is not supported, for example, by, you know, traditional cost differences uh, matter less because of techno uh, because of automation and so on, uh, or it's more a matter of quick uh, delivery times rather than cost differences and so on. So, I mean, these are as important factors, I think, for companies as they consider their optimal global value chains. And 
Christian, you know, like, of course, you did talk about politics uh, in one of your uh, answers, one of your points. Uh, when you really look at the rise of China, that is that is really affecting a lot of countries, like, or they, they are really taking China as a security threat as well, uh, where, wherein they have done economically very, very well, without a doubt. They have grown uh, exceptionally well in the last 20 years. Uh, how do we resolve this issue? Because there is a lot of politics at one end and there is this whole competitiveness viewpoint wherein China does contribute immensely to the global value chains and to the global trade, uh, to the kind of products that we're using and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, I, I wish I would have a good answer to that. I, I, I do think this is a question that will be with us for the next decades, not just a decade, but for a longer period of time. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I've, I've been growing up with uh, focusing on, on the Soviet Union at the time, which was a very different challenge. You know, it was a kind of different ideology and was a military power, but it was not a, a, an economic challenger in any major sense, at least not, not you know, in, 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 in my lifetime. China is very different because it's not so much the, the ideological model that's the real challenge. I mean, the Chinese are not going out every time and trying to convince everybody else that they have to adopt their ideology. Uh, but it is, you know, as a gross machine and quite actually, quite importantly, I think also in the pandemic, I think the argument increasingly in Asia seems to be, especially from the Chinese, but not only them, that, well, this is actually the more effective way for our societies to be run. You know, we can deal with problems uh, while the West, you know, whether it's Europe or the US kind of is, is incapable of making the necessary choices and kind of organizing themselves to deal with these type of, of social challenges. So again, I, you know, I mean, I, I don't think from, from my work, I have a particularly insightful angle on that, that issue, but I think that it's a very different challenge that the West is facing. And ultimately, I think we have to show we as as Western nations, we have to show that we deliver solutions um, to the global challenges in terms of climate change and so on. Uh, but of course, also to the prosperity of our of our populations, you know, to addressing their needs. I think that's much more uh, uh, going to determine uh, where we're going to go than simply kind of the, the the values of you know liberal society that I strongly believe in. But it. The challenge is coming from a different model that says, no, it's only about what we deliver in terms of outcome as effective government. Christian, you know, like when you talk about uh, the liberal view to the world, uh, without a doubt, but then this pandemic and of course the challenges that the world has actually, or the challenge that the world has been facing over the last few months, this has also given rise to the ugly face of discrimination in many, many ways. You've had this movement of, movement, uh, of Black Lives Matter, there has been more discrimination that we hear of in other parts of the world. How do we resolve it? Do, do you think, because of course it does go back to your point in terms of like, how do we really talk about GDP versus inclusion or versus social uh, development, social progress and things. How do we resolve these issues? What, what do you think enterprises can actually do here? Because that's going to be one fundamental point because I think the conversation somehow is saying that, oh, that there's something in the hands of the government. But there is a lot that is hand in, in the hands of the corporations as well. Absolutely, uh, it is, uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, corporations obviously are, are now asked to kind of take a stance on these big issues. Uh, you know, a, a lot in the U.S., um, but I think increasingly also also in Europe. You know, whether it's discrimination, whether it is climate change, and so on. Um, I must admit, you know, I, I, I think we, 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 we clearly need to rethink what the right balance is here. Uh, they are a, a, an important actor. Um, and, you know, as we think about competitiveness, we always talked about public-private collaboration. You know, everybody has to press the buttons that uh, they, they can ad address. And it's, it's a kind of team sport. It's about... Um, concerted action, orchestrating that action. That's also true for these social uh, challenges. Um, what I am though also worried about is, is that a politicization of what companies do, you know, what, for example, universities do, um, is also very, very problematic. Um, now, I don't want this to be an excuse not to act on these social issues we need, but I think there need to do something there, but, but it is actually a fine line 
um, uh, to walk. Uh, I think there are some things, um, um, you know, and, and again, you know, Mike Potter has with his shared value work, I think made, made a huge contribution to show that, you know, it's what companies do is not just kind of a license to operate, but actually by their very actions as businesses, they can provide social value. And I think there's more that can be done there. Um, our work on clusters, I think, you know, now during the pandemic has shown that it's also about the collaboration of individual companies with each other and with other entities, not only to create more profit, but, you know, to address issues that are out there, problems that need to address to society. But then there are also other things that are, I think, generally political issues. So it is about us as, as political systems to set the right type of rules and regulations uh, to make sure that there is no discrimination and we, we can have an inclusive and open society. Um, I don't think we can push that to companies. They don't have the mandate to set the laws. They shouldn't set the laws. And, and I think getting this balance right so that every of these entities plays their, right, their appropriate role, I think is important. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll fight a lot about that in the coming years. So, you know, like Christian, of course, what you're really saying is uh, there are many, many things that can happen in a positive way as we really look at it. And you also said uh, we can look at this crisis as an opportunity to really redefine ourselves as locations, countries, or enterprises. Few things, what do you think can be done to really uh, look at this crisis as an opportunity engine? Uh, because why I ask you that question is important is that when you talk about the previous crisis or the pandemic that happened in the 1980s, 1920, it gave rise to the roaring 20s. And uh, are we really saying that if we get things right, we can actually look at another roaring 20s at this point in time? Yeah, you know, I'm, I mean, obviously I hope so. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite so optimistic. I mean, you know, obviously the 20s was also after the war and there was a lot of pent up demand from that. So uh, I think that maybe was more important than the the, the the Spanish flu when, you know, coming beyond the pandemic. But um, so, so, so let me start, you know, at, at, at a smaller, maybe a little bit more technical level, you know, related to competitiveness and crisis. So, so I think we, we uh, when I was still at, at BCG, I worked with one of my colleagues on, on, on something there to try to kind of understand um, how are, how's the quality of, of business environments, kind of the underlying competitiveness affected by crises. Because a lot of us talk about this building back better and you know crisis as an opportunity um and so what uh, you know we, we we never quite finished that work but i think what we saw emerging in the results was something very interesting uh the first observation is that after crises competitiveness dynamics go down so we we don't improve as much or we might even lose so on average there is a cost of a crisis, and that's basically not so surprising. But but you know, I think that comes out in the fact, uh, in the facts as as we showed them. However, when we looked more closely at the distribution of these cases across countries, we saw that between a normal period, you know, uh, where you look at what's going to happen next year, and and a post crisis period. The distribution after a crisis is not a normal one where, you know, there is a large group that's a slightly worse and then there are some other cases, but it has a strong right hand tail. So about 20% of the cases were actually countries that were able to do much better after the crisis. And they really improved their underlying competitiveness. And of course, what that shows is it is possible to defy the average. It is possible to build back better. But for that, we actually have to do things differently. And, you know, I mean, Manko Olson after World War II argued that this happens if institutional structures are kind of disrupted by a crisis, by a shock. And so you're able to make polit political choices you, that you weren't able to make before. Um, I think this is the way where, that we also need to think about this crisis. You know, so what, what are things that we are now able to do that we understand would, 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 would be good, um, but that for some reason have not been possible in the past, you know, because of some interest group politics and what, 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 whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I can't give a general answer on what this is, you know, maybe it is this broader sense of what our objective is that is 
one of these insights. You know, we've always talked about inclusiveness and sustainability, but I think there's now maybe a different time where, where, where this is appreciated more widely and we are maybe more ready to make choices alongside uh, that. Um, maybe it, has, it is with climate change that I think people have realized that, you know, if there is a crisis, we can do things that we didn't think was possible. Um, so let's think about what we need to do with that type of challenge that we're, that, that we're facing. But, but we have to recognize it does mean to do very different things from before. Uh, and that doesn't happen automatically because we're still, you know, if we're still in the same game and just shouting louder doesn't change that. Christian, you've made some very important points. How, how do you really look at this? Say, if, if I ask you to really use your lens on India, uh, how would you really look at India uh, from this perspective? Like, uh, how, how do you understand India uh, from the 35,000 feet view or from somebody who's sitting outside? Uh, how do you think India can actually make progress, make change, uh, mm. move towards being uh, a high-income economy over a period of uh, time? Now, of course, this is a very dangerous question because, as you know, you know we're, we're just embarking on a major effort to look at Indian competitiveness, and I, I don't know the answer yet, um, but, but you know, some, some observations, I think, that, 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 uh, that I see, um, I think India definitely has enormous opportunities in the future. You know, it's, it's demographics, uh, it's uh, nature as a, as a democracy with all its challenges. Uh, it's young population, you know, um, it's role, you know, somewhere between Europe and the US and, and, and a growing Asia, being part of a growing Asia, but being not China. So I think there are a lot of opportunities here, you know, it's strength in, in, in services and, you know, highly skilled human resources and, and segments of society. Um, but whether or not India realizes these opportunities is quite a different uh, matter. Uh, so, you know, I think maybe, unfortunately, the most likely outcome is that um, India will continue to, you know, to grow quite well. I mean, I, you know, I think there are a lot of macroeconomic uh, um, uh, kind of problems, uh, you know, over the last few years, you know, there's the banking issues and, and so on and so on. But, uh, but ultimately, you know, I think India has still delivered quite strong growth, uh, growth accelerations over the last few decades. Uh, you know, we often forget that because we look at China, but India has really been one of the key growth stories in the global economy. So I think that can easily continue, but, you know, to break out of that and really fully use the, the opportunity of this uh, young and growing uh, population will require kind of uh, rewiring the system in some ways. Um, and, you know, I mean, I hope we can contribute to that thinking process. Uh, but, but again, I think for, for India, it's more the opportunity and how do we realize the opportunity rather than the downward uh, danger of you know, total chaos, I think is relatively limited. It's more the question, how far can we go uh, in, in, in drawing on the, uh, on the deck that we've been given? So uh, Christian, you know, like we, we have a very interesting question from one of the participants here and he says, uh, today, the, when the market economy model is not working well, companies are calling to stay in the market. Uh, yet the sh market share or share market in countries is moving. Will that bring a, a ballooning effect in the near future? Because what we are really seeing is that share markets across the world has re have really risen, but there are so steep challenges that we are really facing today. What, what, what is it that what is really happening? So, so, you know, I mean, I think we have to differentiate between financial markets, if you think about the stock market and so on, and, and you know, the, the real economy markets. Uh, I'm not ex an expert on the financial market side. You know, I, mean, I think we at the moment see a very interesting phenomena. Uh, you know, in the U.S., there is a lot of uh, cash that households have uh, received or saved, which is now going into the financial markets, you know, and uh, sometimes now they challenge hedge funds and so on. So something is happening there. Uh, India, so to, to some degree, also China in the past, had very many retail investors that kind of drove the market and so on. Um, I think the question is, you know, how can that be put into a, a market structure that makes the market better as processing information, you know, making the right long-term uh, long bets? Again, I'm not a financial market expert, but I think that's one of the challenges there. 
I think then there's the real economy. And I think there, you know, for India, clearly the, the challenge is, is not so much entry. You know, there are a lot of very entrepreneurial Indians and there are a lot of small companies and so on. It is scaling or exiting companies. Um, you know, you, you have few, too few companies that really scale up, uh, but you also have too few companies that exit if they don't, uh, if they are not able to grow. And I think that's really keeping um, the broader economic dynamism in, in, in the country really down. Um, so again, you know, I think what, what we need to understand, it's not so much just about the size of the market. It's about the dynamism and effectiveness of rivalry that exists in this market that makes sure that kind of assets flow to the most productive, uh, most value creating type of firms, individuals and activities. Um, markets are a process. We need to make sure that they work well. If they do so, you know, they are much more powerful than planning. Uh, but we need to make sure that they kind of are in a, in, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a position to you know, kind of play that role um, effectively. And, you know, I mean, often they do, sometimes they don't. You know, I mean, uh, Mike Porter worked a lot on healthcare in the US, which looks like much more market oriented than healthcare in many other countries, but is in many ways a disaster. Um, and so, you know, it, it is how you structure the, the, the kind of architecture of that market so that it can deliver what it is able to deliver. So Christian, you know, like we've been talking for the last one hour and I think the time has just flown by, but I do have two more questions for you. One is that if somebody wants to read more or what do you think would be the top three articles or top three books that you would suggest that we should read to really strengthen our thinking in the area of competitiveness? So, I mean, uh, you, you know, it's very boring, but I do still think that uh, uh, Mike Porter's uh, Competitive Advantage of Nations is still a very important read. Um, we, we still haven't read, uh, written the, the, the second volume, which I think has to be about implementation. You know, how do you do this? How do you apply this uh, in the real world? But I think a lot of the ideas, even though the world economy has changed tremendously, are, are, you know, in the three decades since, uh, it's, it, it's still kind of a good, good way to, to look at that. Um, one book, uh, one very recent book that I really liked was uh, just, just came out as, as a, bo a book of uh, a Canadian colleague, Dan Grand Brezhnev's, uh, well, he's Israeli, but he's, he's in Toronto, called uh, Innovation for Real Places. And what I really like about it is that he exactly makes this point about choices, that it's not only Silicon Valley, there are many different ways that innovative economies can look like. Uh, and he also makes the point that you have to look at these choices, not just in terms of our traditional metrics of venture capital and patenting and scientific publications, but what they generate in terms of shared prosperity. And that might lead to a ranking that is quite different um, from, uh, for, for you uh, uh, than uh, what, what you would, what would have thought uh, before. So, uh, so this is another one that uh, I would look back. But uh, in general, I encourage people to look out widely and you know, challenge your own thinking. Don't just uh, look at stuff that confirms your ideas, but challenges you. And uh, hopefully that's where you learn the most. But you made a very interesting point, you know, like quite boring, but very important. So uh, I'm sure Mike will not hate you for this, <laughs> for the whole thing that you said. But I think it's one of the most important books uh, that I've ever read on competitive advantage of nations. I think that that's where it is. But just one last thing, you know, like, what do you think we as individuals could possibly do uh, as we move forward when we're really talking about countries going over a bit of time? It's just a very candid personal suggestion if at all. Yeah, yeah, that's a very open question. But, you know, I, I can just say that I um, uh, really have enormous respect for people that then decide, you know, after they, work, they worked in businesses or in academia to actually take political responsibility. Uh, you know, I, I think in current times, in many countries, this is not a fun job to be a politician. Uh, it's probably not going to be a fun job uh, in the next 10 years either. But we need people that, 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 that have kind of grown in other walks of life and that bring their ideas and want to test them um, uh, in those uh, real environments. You know, I mean, 
you and I, we've worked uh, a lot on competitiveness in many countries in the world. Um, it is easy to be the advisor from the outside and say, you know, these are the big principles and the big ideas. It's uh, quite something different if you are the political uh, uh, leader uh, that's there. And, you know, I mean, I think for me, one, one really important experience was um, um, when I had the chance to work a little bit with, uh, at that time, uh, Latvian Prime Minister Valdis Dombrovskis during the Baltic crisis, uh, where I know that in the morning he was sitting with the IMF and they were telling him that he had to fire 30% of the public sector employees and you know, dramatic cuts in the public budget. And then in the afternoon, he was sitting with us and saying, you know, let's talk about how we can grow our economy and what are opportunities going forward. Um, that was not an easy position to be in. And I think, uh, you know, we need people that are ready to, to take up that challenge, you know, even if there are no easy solutions. Um, so, um, you know, maybe, maybe uh, and, and surprising, but, uh, you know, I, I think that's, let's all of us try to, to see, you know, how we can actively contribute to the solutions and take responsibility rather than just being bystanders and kind of smart commentators. Question. This has just been such a fascinating interaction. I think I just loved it. Uh, we could have gone on for hours on this, uh, but this has just been one of the most insightful interactions I've had on competitiveness, economic development, what we need to do uh, as we look at things and how do we question our assumptions? And how do we really look at the way forward? Uh, but having said that, thanks a lot for joining in today. But just as a side thing, uh, Dan is going to be joining us for a conversation, the book that you referred to, uh, Innovation for Real Places on May 12th for a conversation yeah. with platforms. I didn't know that, but that's great. <laughs> so Dan's going to be there. Uh, and uh, uh, just as a recollection, you introduced me to Dan at one of the Howard meetings mm -hmm. or whatever, and that's how we were in, we've always remained in touch. So that, that's uh, where it is. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, Christian. Uh, it's just been such a pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, and uh, thank you to all who are listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Amit.